The disease process is called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD for short. From now on, we'll generally just call this fatty liver. Fatty liver, or NAFLD, is the most common cause of chronic liver disease in children and adults in the United States. This is a picture of a healthy liver right here, and then an unhealthy liver on top of it that has been replaced by fat. So the top picture represents a patient with fatty liver disease. You can see that the color of the liver in the, in the top picture is abnormal because the actual fat is being um, accumulated in the liver cells. In general, um, you can break down fatty liver into another disease process called NASH, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. NASH is a subset of all patients with fatty liver. In general, non-NASH fatty liver is not dangerous or benign. However, regular non-NASH fatty liver can progress to NASH, and NASH is dangerous because it can progress to cirrhosis, or complete scarring of the liver. And so we'll talk more about that in the next slides. So here is the spectrum of fatty liver in general. So you start with simple steatosis, or just simple fatty liver, with fat accumulation in the liver. This can progress to NASH, which is fat accumulation plus inflammation. Over time, if the inflammation is there, that can lead to complete scarring of the liver, also known as cirrhosis. If you look specifically at patients who start off with fatty liver, about 20% of them progress to NASH over 10 to 15 years. Looking specifically at patients who already have NASH, about 15 to 25% of them progress to cirrhosis over five to 10 years. Once a patient develops cirrhosis, the statistics are grim. Once a patient has cirrhosis, 25% of patients will develop portal hypertension within three years of diagnosis. Portal hypertension can lead to problems including fluid accumulation in the abdomen, which is known as ascites. It can lead to bleeding problems, including vomiting blood, and it can also lead to an enlarged spleen. In addition, once a patient has cirrhosis, about 10 to 40% of patients can develop HCC, or hepatocellular carcinoma, or liver cancer. Overall, the mortality or death rates for patients who have cirrhosis is about 30 to 40% within 10 years. This is adult data. Um, we, do, we do have similar statistics for pediatrics. The scary thing for pediatrics is that cirrhosis has been described in children as young as eight, specifically for fatty liver. Let's look at the prevalence of fatty liver in pediatrics. So this was a paper that showed that the overall prevalence of fatty liver in all children is about 10%. If you only look at pediatric patients with obesity, meaning that their body mass index, or BMI, is greater than 95th percentile, that number, that percentage, will increase from 10% to 40%. So fatty liver affects 40% of obese children. The prevalence of fatty liver also varies with age. If you see here, there's an increased prevalence starting at about the age 10 um, group. So ages 5 to 9, it's a 3% prevalence, and ages 10 to 14 is an 11% prevalence. This is important because this kind of guides us on when we start screening patients for fatty liver. There's also a gender predominance. Boys are more likely to have fatty liver compared to girls. And if you look furthermore into different ethnic groups, you'll see that Asians and Hispanics have increased rates of fatty liver compared to Caucasians and African Americans. Interestingly, Afri African Americans have one of the lowest prevalences of fatty liver, and that's likely due to a protective genetic effect. Fatty liver has been linked with nearly 30% of U.S. Cancer, liver cancer rates. This is looking at statistics from 2004 to 2009, and fatty liver-driven um, liver cancer um, was number two. The number one cause of liver cancer is hepatitis C at 
But now that there is effective treatment for hepatitis C, likely fatty liver will surpass, sur surpass hepatitis C in terms of um, etiology for liver cancer. And this is an example of an unhealthy liver with, a, um, with liver cancer. Once a patient has cirrhosis, often the only way to um, um, help the patient is to offer a liver transplant. This is looking at the percentage of liver transplants in the United States, and you can see here that hepatitis C is a main etiology for patients needing liver transplant, because hepatitis C can also lead to cirrhosis. But you can see here this incline of NASH patients, and this only looks to 2009, and we suspect that over the next 10 to 20 years, if current trends continue, fatty liver will become the most common indication for liver transplant in the United States, and this is very scary. Looking at more recent data from 2015, you can see that this is a number of patients who are on the liver transplant wait list. So you can see that um, fatty liver in the solid line had a sharp incline from 2011 to currently, and it's gonna probably be, become the number one indication for a liver transplant. Unfortunately, we do not have um, proven effective pharma pharmaceutical agents that can fix or reverse fatty liver. There have been studies done in pediatrics that looks at two medications, specifically metformin and vitamin E. That study, known as a tonic study, showed that both metformin and vitamin E were no more effective than healthy lifestyle changes and weight loss in decreasing fatty liver in pediatrics. However, some gastroenterologists or pediatricians might use um, metformin to help with other comorbid conditions, including diabetes. Moreover, um, I encourage my patients to, instead of taking a pill, to look for natural sources of vitamin E. Um, vitamin E can be found in olive oil, broccoli, avocado, almonds, and peanuts. So just simply changing your diet, you can get more um, vitamin E. And vitamin E is known as an antioxidant, which has been proven to, or has been shown to help with fatty liver. So there is an easy way to screen for fatty liver in pediatrics, and that's through a blood test. We're specifically looking at a blood test called ALT. Um, looking at ALT goals, um, it differs for pediatrics and adults. In pediatrics in general, we, rate, we aim for an ALT less than 30 to 40. Different labs might have different thresholds, so don't get too alarmed if your lab has a different um, reference range. But in general, we want it to be less than 30 or 40. So if you believe you have fatty liver or your child has fatty liver, I would encourage you to um, meet with a gastroenterologist. The fatty liver clinic at UCLA, the main goal is to rule out other causes of liver disease that masquerade as fatty liver, but also to prevent progression of liver, di liver disease to cirrhosis. This is a picture of a liver biopsy that shows cirrhosis. You can see here the dark blue staining is all f um, scar tissue of the liver. So what does the clinical workup involve? Your pediatrician or your gastroenterologist will be screening your child for comorbid conditions, specifically diabetes, cholesterol problems, uh, thyroid dysfunction, vitamin D deficiency, and sleep apnea. Sometimes, for example, by correcting sleep apnea, that also improves the liver health. So it's very important to make sure that you screen for comorbid conditions. In addition, more testing might be required to make sure that we're not missing other causes of liver disease. For example, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, autoimmune hepatitis, Wilson's disease, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, celiac disease, and other inborn errors of metabolism can lead to elevated ALT, which might masquerade as fatty liver. Classically, the gold standard for diagnosis of fatty liver is liver biopsy, but this is an invasive procedure that requires general anesthesia for a patient, and so there are new research looking at ways to image the liver and get a diagnosis of fatty liver disease without a liver biopsy. Specifically, there are MRI techniques that are looking at fat fraction of the liver, so you can see here that the red colored 
um, is, more, is, is pure fat in the abdominal wall. And then we actually look at the entire liver and we can quantify how much fat is present in the liver. There's another MR, MRI technique known as MR elastography, and that's looking at liver stiffness, which, kind, which gives us a sense of how much of the liver is replaced by scar tissue. So in patients with high shear stiffness, they're more likely to have advanced stages of liver fibrosis. In patients who work with their pediatricians and gastroenterologists very closely and are, are simply unable to lose weight, in adolescence, um, we are starting to offer bariatric surgery for patients. Patients have to go undergo a rigorous six to 12 month um, supervised, medically supervised um, weight loss attempt before um, doing something as definitive as surgery. According to the American Society um, of uh, Metabolic Bariatric Surgery, uh, patients who have a BMI of greater than 35 with major comorbidities can be considered for bariatric surgery. Um, if you have a BMI greater than 40 with some other comorbidities, you may also qualify. Specifically for fatty liver, that's actually a major comorbid condition. So if your BMI is greater than 35 and you have severe fatty liver, you may be considered for one of the bariatric surgery procedures. So let's talk. In addition, besides um, uh, looking at different medications that are being looked at to decrease fatty liver, the mainstay of treatment right now is healthy lifestyle habits, diet change, and exercise. So let's look into more specifically about what you can change in your diet for your um, child. In general, I tell patients to avoid white foods. So white foods like white rice, white breads, um, mashed potatoes, they tend to have high glycemic index. A food with high glycemic index will increase glucose levels in the body, leading to a surge of insulin. So compared, comparing, for example, um, whole wheat bread to white bread, it is better to eat the whole wheat bread. I also tell parents to avoid foods that have added fructose or added sugars. So we can teach you in clinic how to read food labels and to avoid specifically the added sugars and fructose. Also, um, I do not recommend a low-fat diet in pediatrics especially because growth and development is very important. But I do recommend increasing the portion of healthy fats. So for example, omega-3 fatty acids are healthier than, for example, trans fat. You can find these healthier fats in foods like nuts, fish, and avocado. In addition, we can also see you in clinic and work with a registered dietitian to make sure that your child is getting balanced macronutrients, that their diet isn't, you know, 60% fat or too low of protein. We want to make sure that they're getting the, the balanced macronutrients in their diet. I also recommend limiting liquid calories. Juice, soda, smoothies, energy drinks, and whole milk often have a lot of calories that children can drink very fast, and it can make up a large portion of their caloric intake for their day. Moreover, a lot of these drinks don't have um, fiber to kind of slow down digestion. So for example, um, drinking a glass of orange juice is not the same as eating an actual orange. And that leads us to fiber. So make sure that I always try to make sure that um, patients ha are getting enough fiber in their diet. In general, adults should be getting about 20 to 30 grams of fiber in their diet. For a younger child, I usually use the formula, their age plus four, and that equals the number of grams you want to aim for in a day. So to kind of summarize um, more ways to um, change your lifestyle habits to decrease um, your chances of getting fatty liver. Uh, we encourage patients to decrease sedentary time, so specifically screen time. iPads, iPhones have become very predominant in today, today's mobile society, um, and children and teens can spend up to eight hours um, in front of a screen. So I encourage limiting that to, to two hours max per day and to actually get out and, and be active and um, do other things. We already talked about eliminating sugar sweetened beverages. I also tell patients to increase fruits and vegetables, aim for it to be half of your plate at each meal. Moreover, we also recommend at least an hour of physical activity each day, ideally an activity that will get your heart rate up. 
for a sustained amount of time. It is difficult to lose weight, and so we encourage families to work together. If you just have one child in the family who's only on a diet and everyone else is, um, hasn't changed their lifestyle habits, it's going to be very hard for that child to make those changes. So I encourage that the entire family get on board and make goals for each person in the family. Try not to focus more on the total amount of weight loss that you want to achieve, but just make small, realistic goals. In general, I tell patients not to lose more than half a pound to a pound per week. You don't want to lose the weight too fast because it often will come, come back very quickly. In pediatrics, we think that there's an epidemic of poor sleep. And poor sleep has been shown to increase ghrelin levels, which is a neurotransmitter that increases your appetite. So if your child is not getting enough sleep, they will have increased appetite during the day. So I would encourage you to discuss with your pediatrician um, the number of hours of sleep that is appropriate for your child's age. And finally, we, uh, we encourage avoid late night eating. I would encourage um, only maybe a piece of fruit as, a, as a, a late night snack. Definitely try to eat your meals earlier on in the day. So to summarize what we discussed today, Fatty liver or NAFLD is the most common cause of liver disease in children and adults in the United States. Fatty liver can lead to cirrhosis and liver cancer. And fatty liver will likely become the leading reason for liver transplant in the next few decades. No pharmacologic treatments have been proven effective definitively. Weight loss through diet and exercise are the only proven effective treatment for pediatrics at this point and prevention of fatty liver disease is of utmost importance. I thank you for your time, and now I'm gonna open it up for questions. So the first question is, do all pediatric patients need to be assessed for fatty liver disease? So that depends on the child's age. It also depends on other factors, including ethnicity, family history of fatty liver, family history of cirrhosis, family history of liver cancer. In general, the guidelines show that if a child is obese, particularly after age 10, because that's when there's increased risk of getting fatty liver, if your child is obese, meaning that your body mass index is greater than 95th percentile, um, I, we definitely recommend annual screening for fatty liver with a simple blood test. For patients two to, 10 years eight, two to 10 years of age, that may not be mandatory, but it's often encouraged for screening. Um, in babies, we don't particularly worry about fatty liver because it does take years to develop fatty liver. If someone's suspecting liver problems in ages zero to two, usually it's not fatty liver, and it's usually some other diagnosis. The second question is, do all fatty liver disease patients need liver biopsy? Definitely not. So a lot of patients um, will fall into the category of fatty liver, but um, if you just have st simple steatosis but no inflammation, um, then we basically will just monitor you and you don't need a liver biopsy. The main um, question that we do for liver biopsy is if we suspect advanced scarring or advanced fibrosis in a patient and we need to know the extent of liver damage. It's also, liver biopsy is also useful in patients that we're not sure, not, we're not 100% sure on the diagnosis of um, fatty liver disease and we need to rule out other causes of um, liver disease. So if there's not any more other questions, I thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed the webinar, um, and I hope you have a great day.